Notice it didn't just say by counsel, and it definitely didn't say by foolish counsel, but it says by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in the multitude of counselors there is safety. You may be seated. And so tonight we're going to talk about really the powers. Uh, on the screen it says the wisdom of counsel, but we're going to talk about um, the power of godly counsel, the power of godly counsel. Have you ever thought about how many decisions you make in the run of a day from the time that you wake up and your eyes open and your feet hit the floor? Have you ever considered the number of decisions that you make throughout the day? Probably from the time that you get up and go downstairs or go to do whatever, you probably make 50 or 60 uh, decisions just in that short period of time. And those decisions and those choices that we make, those everyday choices, they're so simple, we, we do them almost automatically, you know, and we call those no-brainers. But then there are other decisions and other choices that we have to make that require a whole lot of prayer, a whole lot of planning, and a whole lot of thought because we realize that the future of my life, and not only my life, but the life of others that may be connected to me, may be either favored are not favored because of this decision that I'm making. And when you have time to make that decision, a good thing to do, a good thing to do is always um, get some counsel and go and talk to somebody about it. Again, because decisions have outcomes. And so tonight, what I want to talk to you about, because he said that some decisions are heavy. Some decisions are like, like going to war, like buying a house. Is that, is that a huge decision? You know another huge decision that people ought to pray about and give more thought to? Choosing a mate. Choosing a mate, things like that. What's some career decisions? Career decisions. When you feel like you need to relocate and go to another city, do you, do you just hop up and go? Those are the kind of decisions that will wake you up at 2.30 at night while everybody is asleep and, and you're up, you know, you walk on the floor wondering what you should do. Well, the Bible says that whenever you have decisions like that, whenever you have those weighted decisions, you need to seek out godly counsel because there's safety and there is strength in counsel. And this is why I thank God for my pastor. Most people don't understand. I've had this happen where people really don't understand the relationship of the pastor that sits up under another pastor. People that need a whole lot of attention they, they won't work in those kind of relationships. You got to call them all the time, pat them all the time, because they'll think like if I don't get your attention all the time, that, that you're not really fathering me or pastoring me. But when I talk to my pastor, I may talk, oh, geez, when's the last time I talked to him? No, no, no. We, we talked on the phone before he went to South Africa for, th for three weeks. And, um, and I think he may be back now. But we, sometimes we go, to, we go without months, but when I call him, because I know what he does, I only call him and we talk when I have a decision to make that I know has some, not grave responsibility, but heavy weights attached to it. Um, there, there are some things that, that we're considering now in ministry, and, um, and I haven't done it yet, but the first thing I did is I called and I got counsel. People don't realize how valuable godly counsel is. When somebody has been in a war that you have yet to fight, and they've already fought those wars and fought them successfully. Do you know how valuable it is when you see that same storm that you're about to deal with and someone allows you access, someone with that size of church, that size of influence allows you access and will allow you if need be to come and sit in their presence and they will talk you through the process. Do you know how valuable that is? That's why, I, I don't know about you, see some people don't, put, don't place a premium on godly counsel. But Paul says, if I have sown into your life spiritual things, shall I not also reap from you carnal things? So I will never go and talk to my pastor and sit down and get godly counsel and just walk out with a thank you and a handshake. To me, that's a slap in the face. That's ungodly. This man didn't have to talk to you. He doesn't even have to ask me, you see? And so again, because I honor him in that relationship that way, and I'm not, not called, Pastor, do you think I should preach this Sunday? You know, some folk need, you, you just got to Oh, Jesus, it's just hard to pastor some folk. But when I call him and he gives me counsel, I appreciate it. Amen. Now, I'll give you a good example. You have people, like I'm about to give you some principles of godly counsel right now. Now, if you look at the people that are here, this is not nearly what we look like on Sunday. You see, and I'm giving you counsel right now. And some people are getting cheap counsel because they're going to do it by live stream. And so they're watching right now. And so I'm giving you godly counsel. But people that don't listen to the word of God are always people 
not always, but the majority of the time, the attendance is not where it should be, and they're coming to church asking you about something, and sometimes I tell people, were you at church Sunday? Were you at Bible study Thursday? We don't need to talk. Go ahead and make an investment. Buy this MP3 and everything you need to know. In other words, if you had been in place, you would have received the counsel that you needed to deal with the situation that you're facing. So let's go ahead and get into this, and I want to share some things with you. Now, um, look at Luke chapter 14, verse 28 and, uh, and 32. Now, uh, again, and this is why you ought to give thought. You ought to give thought before you make a decision. Old folk, old folk used to talk about don't haul off and do stuff. You know, and I'm purposely slow. I'm at the point now in life where I purposely go slow because I'm not looking for a good decision. I'm looking for a God decision. For it says, which of you intending to build a tower sit it not down, not last, not after, but when? You sit down first, and then you look at your resources. You count the cost, whether we have sufficient to finish it. This isn't really talking about building a building. It is, but what Jesus was talking about was the cost of discipleship. People say, well, I want to follow you. Well, do you really want to follow me? Because Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him what? Let him first deny himself and then take up his cross and then follow me. So people sometimes ask questions or jump up to serve in positions before they've actually sat down and count the cost. That is so important for my young ministers and young pastors. When you get into this, <laughs> listen, you better be true to this. Because if you don't sell out and invest everything you have in it, your ministry will never, go beyond the level, never grow beyond the level of your faith. All right? So he says, now, less happily after they laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that uh, behold it began to mock him, saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. Okay, and that, that, that's fine. And so again, what Jesus is trying to tell us when it comes to decision-making process, sometimes don't rush into it, wait and count the cost. And then we just read the other scripture that says we ought to get godly counsel. I see people do some stuff sometimes. And I, and I wonder, were you ever at this church? <laughs> Did you ever hear a word that was spoken from the pulpit? And you wonder, how in the world could you be that obtuse? And it's just because some, and I, and I have to come to accept that some people just simple. Now, y'all may not like it, but the, the writer in Proverbs talks about simple-minded people. And some people are just simple-minded. But the word that you hear, never come to a church and be ever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Did you hear that? The Bible says there are some people, they will always be learning, and they will never come to a knowledge of the truth. They will sit, and they will hear, and they will hear, but they will never walk in the revelation of what they heard. Don't be that kind of person, all right? Okay, now, let's go ahead. Let me give you some of these things about, um, about counsel tonight that I want you to pay attention to. Um, okay. First of all, I want to call this section making right moves. Everything you want to do is not always the right thing you, the right thing for you to do. And everything that you want is not always the thing that you're supposed to have. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 12. Have you ever just wanted to do, you had a decision that you, you wanted to make and you wanted to do it because you wanted to do it? Okay, counsel. And let's talk about marriage a little bit. Years and years ago, long time ago, um, and this is how my credit got messed up. Um, if, if it was tech and it was brand new and it was the most powerful, and I'm still like that today, I had to have it. I just had, it didn't matter what the cost was. I didn't care. And I think I told you all this maybe about a month ago about the Gateway 2000. I bought this big tower computer and, and, and uh, this big screen and all this stuff had all kinds of power. And it just started me on a cycle of borrowing money that I knew I wasn't going to pay back. Now, here's the thing. When I wanted that computer, I didn't need that computer. And because it cost so much, what I should have done in hindsight is sat down with Mrs. Deborah and say, listen, this is what I want to get. Can any brother out there tell me why I didn't take that step? Say what now? See, all the guys know. Y'all, you sitting there right now beside your wife, scared to say it. <laughs> yes, she was going to say no, Pastor. Your wife just like hunching over there. <laughs> and that's the, I don't want to hear no, you see? And so that's the thing. A lot of times when we want something and we don't want to hear a no, the counsel that we seek is not godly counsel. The, count, the voice that we look for is a voice that we think is going to agree with us. Yes, 
Y'all have never sought out a yes? You don't want to go to the... See, let me tell you who your real friend is. Your real... See, if I have to agree with you to be your friend, maybe I'm a fan and not a friend. But a real friend doesn't always have to agree with you. And a real friend will tell you what you need to know. Whether you like it or not. Yeah, I was thinking about this, you know, again, the, the dynamic between pastors who have pastors. If you really have a pastor and a pastor sees you doing stuff on social media or stuff that's out of the way or he feels it might damage your testimony in some kind of way, then he ought to be yanking your chain. But sometimes people don't like that. They, they don't yank your chain because of the offering that you send. But see, you have to love people enough that my concern for you is greater than any seed you may sow. As a matter of fact, this is probably one of the greatest manifestations of my love. I'm trying to put you in check now before you wreck yourself. You see? And so sometimes what happens is we want things that are not good for us. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've seen it with, with folk that are getting married, you know? And, and you just want to do what you want to do. And anything that goes contrary, okay. <laughs> No, I'm just thinking because I can tell you about situations, but I don't want to mention a situation that people in here may be familiar with. That I don't want to do that. So I'm making sure in my mind this is a clear situation. But uh, we, we had a, a person that was going here, had been here for a long time, and her daughter was dating this other dude. She was married while she was dating this other dude. He was married while he was dating her. So they were in an adulterous relationship and were engaged and wanted me to counsel them. And, and, and when I told the mother, I'm not doing that, they left. And she's divorced. And he's divorced. I could have told you that was going to happen the way you started. But when you don't tell people what they want to hear and they really want to do, this is the problem with Christianity. We keep as much of the Bible as we want to keep so that we can still do what we want to do. You see? And so what godly counsel does is, to, is, I'll give you a good example. There's something I want so bad. I want it so bad. I want to start on this project right now. But God says, wait. Yes, sir. Wait. Then there's another project I've been waiting on since we started this ministry. And I didn't even tell Deborah about it. I was walking down the road because when I had a vision. That's when I saw this thing. I was walking down the road. God took me back in the vision while I was walking. She didn't even know what was happening. And he said, now it's time. And it was just that quick and just, just gone, just like that. And I know it's time to move forward, you see. And so there's timing involved. Sometimes it's not that God doesn't want you to have it. It's he doesn't want you to have it now. Now, if you raise children, if you have children, you ought to understand what I just said. Yes, they want it, and yes, I love you, but because I love you, I'm going to say no at this particular time because, boy, I know you. I gave birth to you, and I know you may think that you're ready for it, but as mama, as daddy, you're not ready. So because I love you, I'm going to tell you no. Now, he mad at you and want to, you know, want to get all grown and whatnot because you said no. Take it. Stop trying to be a friend and be a parent. That's why a lot of folk are in trouble now. You don't know when to switch from friend to parent. And you're so busy over here being friend that you're letting the parent side slip. Now they're telling you what to do. All right. <laughs> First Corinthians. Did we look at our scripture? Okay. Look at, the, look at what he says. Remember, everything I want to do is not something that's good for me to do. Everything that's good to me is not good for me. How many of you are adults and you say, I touched something that was good to me, Pastor. But it was not good for me. All right, now watch this. All things are lawful. Let's do this in the NIV tonight. Let's have fun. Let's do easy reading. Easy reading tonight. Let's let them swoop us. Okay. Now, I have a right to do anything. That's a bold statement. I have a right to do anything. <laughs> Deborah and I were having this conversation. I'll insert this parenthetically about where our government is, is, is faltering on some issues. Um, you can't take away a person's right to do something. You can make it illegal. But when you really start taking away a right for somebody to do something, then you're doing something God doesn't do. Have you ever noticed God doesn't bother with your choice? He will let you choose. And so he says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. Okay? You can go out tonight. You can get you some Hennessy. You can get you some nod ahead. You know, and just say, you know what? <laughs> I just feel like hanging out. Let's just go party and whatnot. Now, when you get stopped for that DWI going home, you had a right to do exactly what you did. But is it beneficial now that you're getting your license taken? Is it beneficial now that you'll probably lose your job because of foolish behavior? So just because you have a right to do it doesn't make what you're doing right. Uh, he says, now, I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Do you know some things that... 
The Bible says that, that we shouldn't use our liberty for certain things to offend other people. Even though you have a right by the grace of God to do certain things, never get to the point where that thing controls you and you can't let it go. The Bible says, I want to say in 1 John somewhere, it says, of whom a man is overcome, by the same is he brought into bondage. Anything that you're doing that you can't just stop right now doing, check that and see if that's not an area of bondage in your life. It can be drinking coffee. It can be drinking Pepsi. Now, you say, that's so benign. Okay? You, have you ever seen anybody addicted to Pepsi? Now, maybe you all haven't seen it. Deborah's mother was addicted to Pepsi. That's all she drank. She bought these big liters of Pepsi, kept Pepsi. She'd go to bed, and Pepsi and ice would be watered down by the bed. She'd wake up in the morning. Pepsi was her drink. You couldn't go to the store without getting Pepsi. Pepsi brought on sugar diabetes, and she lost a leg because she was addicted to something that she couldn't stop. Now, you say, well, oh, you know, <laughs> y'all have... Y'all, I watch life. I watch how life evolves, and I watch how sometimes people get taken out by things that they didn't have to get taken out by. They had authority over it, but didn't exercise the authority over it, and the thing that they were supposed to dominate ended up not only dominating, but conquering them and taking them out. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Okay? And so just because you have a right, you got to be careful because some stuff you do freely, the devil knows you have a right, and he throws that carrot. And you bite that carrot. He pulls and you follow it again. You bite it again. Next thing you know, you hooked. You in too deep. <laughs> I, y'all say, people, y'all don't know about being in too deep and, and, and not being able to get out. Let me show you something else. First Corinthians uh, 10 and 23. Again, in the NIV, I want to take a look at this. I want to take a look at this. You'd be amazed at the power that God has given you. But you have to exercise that power and say, I will not be brought into into under subjection to any of these things. So use your freedom wisely, okay? Now, I have a right to, that's the same, that's the same thing. I have a right to do anything, you say, but everything is not beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. I think in the King James is a different rendering of that. I know it is, it's a different rendering, okay? All things are lawful to me, but all things are not beneficial. Just because I have a right to go someplace doesn't mean I want to go there. Did you hear what I just said? Just because you have a right and you're grown enough to go there doesn't mean you ought to be in that environment. It's like, I'll give you an example. Like, like comedians and, and comedy clubs and stuff. Like one of my favorite comedians was here a couple of weeks ago, Sinbad. I didn't know he was here. But a lot of situations I don't go to and put myself there, not because I can't go there, but I'm thinking about people whose faith may not be where my faith is and who my, my liberty to them might become a stumbling block. And Paul said, if that's the case, even though it's okay for you to do it, don't do it for their sake. And that's what love is all about. See, I like to party sometimes too. Y'all don't invite me to the party. I have to stay home. <laughs> oh, all right. Now, here's another thing. You talk about godly counsel and the wisdom of godly counsel. What you're getting ready to do, weigh your motives. Isn't it funny how people will try to fool you about their motives? They'll try to make you think, I mean, just watch politics. Just, just watch politics. That's, that's all it's about, all right? Fooling people and making them think different things about different things, okay? Listen, God knows your heart. Impure motives eventually will flesh themselves out. Did you hear what I just said? Impure mo- motives eventually will flesh themselves out, okay? Um, I'll give you a good example about impure motives. Some people get married because they're, they're broke, basically, and they're hiding they're broke. Um, I forgot that thing when they called it, uh, they had some of the craziest stuff on the internet. Homeless phobia, homophobia, something like that about a broke dude that's looking for a lady that's got some money. And that's, it, it broke a, broke a holic or something like that. But anyway, <laughs> but do you know some people, guys will do this. They'll hide how much money they have. And the reason that they're really marrying the girl is not, they kind of love her, but what they're really looking at is what the person can bring to their lives. And it goes both ways. It goes both ways. See, some people don't want you. (laughs) They just want what comes with you, you see. And so what happens is when you get into a relationship like that, if the motives weren't pure, eventually let the money leave. Let a physical ailment come where you have to be tended to or they have to take care of you for life. And you'll find out whether their motives were pure. You see it all the time in ministry. And, you know, I, I just thank God 
I never say this, but I, I thank God that sometimes he just allows you to discern where a person is talking to you, and you know it don't feel right. You know it doesn't feel right. Why is it when you know it doesn't feel right that you go ahead anyway? Like you're going to make it right simply by going ahead anyway. Oh, Lordy. Have y'all ever been in some of this stuff I'm talking about? Galatians. Well, yeah, Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 16. What is really motivating you? Is money motivating you? Y'all have no idea how often I do this heart check or I let the Holy Ghost do this heart check. It goes on throughout my day several times a day as it relates to why are you doing what you're doing? Are you coming from a pure place? Or are you trying to cause trouble and hurt somebody else? Are you coming from a place of anger? Here's the, here's the thing. To him that is pure, all things are pure. Does, does that make sense to you about checking your motives? When you're mo I, Oh, God, I got a meeting tomorrow with a pastor. My biggest concern is that he understands what my motives are. Amen. Because a pastor with wrong motives could take advantage of this situation. And over and above anything else, what I want him to know is I am your pastor and I would never do anything to hurt you or your family or your church. I want you to know that the decisions that I'm making, they're coming from a pure place. You see? Because not everybody in ministry comes from a pure... And this is probably one of the most um, disturbing things or disappointing things that I've had to encounter in ministry is when you look at people and you, you have this image of who they are and then you get a chance to talk to them and you realize that that is all a facade and, and everything else. I don't, I don't want to be your friend. I don't want to hang out with you. I don't want to move in your circle. I don't want to speak on your platform. Even if you open that door, I wouldn't walk into it Amen. because I understand how you operate. Your motives aren't pure. At the end of the day, let me tell you something. Do you know what God is going to look at? Not so much the act but he's going to look at the motive behind the act. Do you know, the, have you ever studied the conversation that David had with Nathan when God was speaking through Nathan to David about his adultery with Bathsheba? God said, if you wanted another wife, he said, all you had to do was ask. He said, so why in the world did you go through all of those steps that you did? What he was trying to get David to do was look deeper than the act and find out why he went through all of those machinations to get that thing done. When David finally figured it out, you know what he said? He said, Lord, he said, create within me. He wasn't worried about anybody else, not Bathsheba. He said, create within me a clean heart. And then he said, renew. A now, why did he say renew a right spirit? Because at one time, his spirit was right with God. When God chose me, he said, I found a man who's after mine own heart. And something happened in his heart. He said, God, put me back to where I was in my relationship with you. Put me back to where I was in my relationship with my fellow man. Restore. Amen. Have you ever got, see, I've been way out there. And I had to go back to God and say, God, God, do something with my heart. Because my heart ain't feeling right. And when my heart starts feeling wrong and I have stuff in my heart, I don't know about you. I can't sleep. It, it just bothers me. I will bend. If I have wronged you and I know I've wronged you and I've offended you and you have told me that I've offended you, you don't have to look for me. You don't have to beg me to say I'm sorry. It's not a pride issue for you. I'd rather you be okay. And I'd be okay. Because that's how you get points with God. God looks at your heart. And don't you ever for one moment think that you can fool him. You can't come to God with this fake humility and trying to pray to God and impress the people and think God doesn't know what you're doing. God sees your heart. All right. Here's another thing. Be careful of monetary compensation and monetary gain. What am I going to get out of it? Um, when you do things <laughs> that are motivated by money, I've seen people move because of a job, but when they moved because of the job, they couldn't take the spouse. It wasn't that they didn't love the spouse. They were really trying to do something to help the family, but in order for them to do it, they had to go to the other side of the country. Understanding the nature of the matter and understanding the nature of the marriage if you give counsel and say, listen, I know that's a $50,000 raise. I understand what you're looking at. But look at the nature of the relationship. Is the relationship strong enough at this time 
to handle you being way out there, but I'm going to be doing this, I'm going to be doing that. Then I hear, oh, we're getting a divorce. Why? It was so unnecessary. It was so unnecessary. You see, and so what, what was the motivating thing behind it? More money. You know what? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, y'all don't understand what I'm saying. Um, we moved not too long ago. It's a big house. And, um, and sometimes I walk through the big, and I just say, God, I thank you. I th- it ain't super big, but it's a big house. I say, God, thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Now, I don't need no more than that. Did you hear what I just said? So I don't, I don't need 10,000 square feet. It's just us. And age, what am I going to do with that? So you get to a point where you realize, okay, I have it. I'm in it. There's more to life than this because it will not make you happy. It will not make you bigger. It will not make you better. And any issues you had in the small house, trust me, they will move with you to the new house. You don't, you don't leave the issues in the other house and just because you move, well, bye-bye, bye-bye. No. You bring them with you, you see? And so what I'm trying to get you to understand is even if you get all the stuff, some, I don't care how much money you get, some stuff will not be fixed no matter what you surround yourself with, no matter who you surround yourself with, no matter what things you surround yourself with, no matter what clothes you put on. Let me tell y'all something about Pastor Deborah and heart. And again, I'm talking about motives and money and watching your heart all the time, right? She tells me all the time, she said, uh, oh, you, you, you're smelling yourself now. Because <laughs> I, I used to do the shop, right? Because, I mean, it, I, you know, so now I go to the mall with her all the time now, you know? And... Uh, and I look at little fashion stuff I think I can wear for my age because you got to be age appropriate, right? You, you, you can't go like FUBU and hat flip backward and all crazy with it. You got you to gotta stay in your lane, you know? So at some point, I let everything go gray and do beard gang gray and then fashion out that way. But right now, I'm just coming around. Okay. And so sometimes you stand in the mirror like you're grooming your little beard, you know, and you're looking at your little self and, hey, you know? And, uh, and while you're looking there in the mirror, you'll hear the Holy Ghost say, don't forget who you are. And you know who he's talking to? Your heart. Because it's not about all that exterior stuff. It's not all about that. Marvin, the reason I elevated you, the reason I favored you, the reason I blessed your life was because of none of that stuff that you're doing now. It was because I saw something in your heart. That's what will get God's attention every time. And so that's why, you know, you have to keep your heart clean because it will limit. And so a lot of times, this is where the monetary thing comes in. Monetary stuff will, me- will mess your heart up. <laughs> Some people, some people, some people can be bought, okay? God is looking for people that cannot be bought, that cannot be influenced, that cannot be changed because of monetary gain. He's looking for folk. And people, let me, um, folk will tell you this, that, that have traveled, my, my, uh, my assistants that travel with me, very rarely do I accept an honorarium, especially if the church is small. Why? You need this. I'm going to bless you with it. Talking about motives and monetary things. I went to a church one time, a church small, asked me to preach. And the guy, um, I didn't even, um, I said, here, man, you go ahead and you bless the church with this. Now, check it out. Check it out. This is what he did, right? Before, we, before I ministered, he was talking to me, picking my brain about some things I wanted to do, and I shared with him. Okay. A couple of weeks later, one of the ideas that was in my mind, he had taken it and marketed it and run with it and put his name on it. And I said, now, check this dude out. I'm trying to bless him. And this is what he does to me. You know what you have to do to keep your heart right? You have to be like a Timex. Y'all ever hear take a licking and just keep on ticking? Don't think I don't know what you did. I know exactly what you did. And I still love you. Hey, partner. But we'll never partner together. You'll always be over there. And I'll be waving at you from a distance, loving you from a distance, and praying for you from a distance. But I'm going to keep my heart pure. And it's necessary not for me to come around you to keep my heart pure at this time. <laughs> Some folk you have to you have to stay away from to keep your heart right. Okay? Now, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21. About monetary gain and motives. Let me tell y'all something, and I'll be very candid with you. One of the worst decisions that I ever made, now if you're still involved, I'm not trying to hurt you, was to get my church involved in a multi-level marketing scheme. To this day, I that is the worst mistake I've ever made. And, and one of the reasons that I did it, not knowing one of the reasons, yeah, the major motivating factor behind it was financial gain. See, all money ain't good money. I'm going to say it to you again. All money ain't good money. 
And I learned something from that as a pastor. And this is what I learned. Even because they sent a big shot in to recruit me in Durban. And even while I'm sitting there, you know, my heart was telling me, don't. But then I had to call and ask some other pastors, go for it, go for it. Then some other pastors called me and took me out to breakfast and said, go for it, go for it. And I went for it, I went for it. It took me about 90 days to figure out what was happening. And I said, wow, and I regretted it and I repented. I repented. It bothered me so much I wanted to give people their money back. That's how much it bothered me. But when you have a heart like that and you say, God, I'm sorry. Now, it may be right for somebody else. It wasn't right for me. But when you go to God, you say, God, I'm sorry. Guess what? God pays attention to stuff like that. One of the reasons he kicked Saul out of the kingdom, Saul didn't know how to say he was sorry. When Saul got in trouble and made a bad decision, you know what he did? The people made me do it. We brought those, those uh, animals back because we were going to sacrifice them to you. In other words, God saw your heart. Man, you can't fool God. Why do we even try? I don't even understand as human beings, why do we even try knowing that God knows everything? You're rising up, you're lying down. He said, before a word is even formed in your mouth, he said, I already know your thoughts. So why lie and try to fool him? Boy, it's quiet in the church tonight. All right. Let's, <laughs> oh, let's talk about something else. This is the last one, then we're going to go home. Acknowledge your present help. Pastor, what do you mean, acknowledge your present help? Pain will teach you a lesson that pride won't let you learn. Some folk have so much pride, rather than you asking for help, you rather just burn. Just crash and burn. And help can be right there next to you. Y'all have never seen situations in life like that? It may have been you. Where the thing that you needed was as close to you as a phone call. But because of pride, you wouldn't ask. And you know what the Bible says? You have not because you ask not. Why didn't you ask for help? God knows. Oh, so many things. I'm like, why did you let it get this far? Do you know we could have alleviated the entire situation? If you had just let us know earlier, we could have stopped this. We, why did you let it go this long? And now you bring a situation that's irretrievable. You bring a situation that can't be put back together. Why do people go through life trying to make it seem like you don't need no help and you got everything together? That's pride. And pride goes before a fall. One of the seven things that God hates is a proud look. You see? And so when, when you get in trouble and you need help, and this is a funny thing, God will put the word you need in the mouth of a person you don't like. And because of your pride, <laughs> he, was that, that thunder? That one thunder was? Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, he, he told you to go and talk to the person, but you don't like them. This is the kind of God he is. He'll tell you to go and see somebody that you don't like. And the reason that he did it is because there's a roadblock between you and what God wants to do in your life, and the roadblock is pride, and he's trying to get you to get over it, Okay. A person that almost missed it was Naaman, Naaman. Some people pronounce it Naaman. How many of you are familiar with the story? He was an awesome man, a man of power, a man of prestige and whatnot, but he had a problem in his flesh. He was leprous, which means he couldn't function. Even though he had power and authority, he couldn't exert it because of his condition. And um, there was, I think, a little slave girl that was working in his house from Israel, and she said, there's a prophet over there that you ought to go see. And so he went the way that he was used to going, expecting to be treated the way that he was used to be treated. All the money, all the entourage, all the pomp. So he goes to the prophet's house, knock on the door. And I imagine his assistant probably went and knocked on the door. Yeah, you, you know, the, the honorable brother Naaman, Naaman is out here to see you. He came a long way. Prophet didn't even stop eating, didn't even go to the door. Just, he said, tell him go dip in the, in the Jordan River seven times. A lot of y'all would have went home. Because we would have been saying like, say what? I, I came with all this money and all this stuff. You don't even have, do you know who I am? And you mean to tell me you don't, you, don't, you don't have enough respect for me and the position that I hold to come out and just say, hey, go dip in the jaw. He, he kept going back and forth, back and forth, but some kind of way he made it to the river. And I imagine while he was dipping, he was fussing while he was dipping. I imagine he started fussing until around dip number five or six. And he began to notice some change in his complexion. Around verse 7, he came up praising God. All right? Now, get here again, going back to motivation. He goes back to the man of God. Say, listen, all this stuff is still yours. I know you didn't come to the door, but I'm just happy my skin is healed. 
And, um, and he had a prophet, he had a servant that named Gehazi. And because uh, the, the first time the prophet told him, said, I don't want that stuff. He said, that's, that's, it's not, a, it ain't about that. All right, just go do what I told you to do. So the guy tells him, yeah, my master changed his mind. He said, my master changed his mind. And, and we'll take, let me see, let me see, that's, that's uh, Dulce and Cabana, that's Gucci over there. Let me get a couple of them Armani shoes. Those gators, we want all those gators right there. What size are those 10? Yeah, we want to make sure we get those. And the money, oh, yes, please, he's decided he's going to take an offering. He's going to honor the Lord for that. So he takes the stuff, and he goes and hides it. Wrong motivation. Comes back and didn't know who he was serving. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Stands before the man. He said, hey, man, where you been? He said, oh, I've been to and fro and, and here and there run. <laughs> and he said, didn't I tell you this is not the time to take filthy lucre? He said, now the leprosy that was on the king, he said, now the leprosy is going to come on you. Now, you all don't understand how heartbreaking this was. This was heartbreaking because Elisha had received a double portion anointing from Elisha. And if you know anything about Elijah's ministry, Elijah was, Elijah was so powerful. No, it was Elisha. Um, Elisha was so powerful after receiving that double uh, portion that he was dead. And they threw somebody in the hole where his body had been buried. And the dead man jumped back up, got out of the grave, and came alive. He had enough anointing in his bones to raise people from the dead. So if he got that as a down payment or as an inheritance or as an endowment from serving his master, and Gehazi had served him faithfully up until that point, where do you think Gehazi was positioned before he messed up with the money? It's not worth it. There's no amount of money that you can give me for the anointing. It's just not worth it. Did y'all get anything out of the Word of God? And I think we were talking about financial, mo uh, financial motivation then. You, you got to be careful about that money thing. Amen? Amen? Father God, we thank you so much for your Word tonight. Father, wisdom, you said wisdom is more precious than silver and gold. Knowledge, understanding. God, we don't want earthly wisdom, not necessarily earthly knowledge, but we need heavenly wisdom, heavenly knowledge, heavenly understanding. God, give us the grace of wisdom to stand back and see situations not as we see them because, God, many times the way we look at it is all wrong. Give us the grace to stand back and look at life's situations and see them through your eyes and feel them with your heart and feel them with your compassion and then grace us to love the way that you would love in the midst of those situations. Father, we want to be children that reflect your glory, that reflect not only your glory and your power, but we want to reflect your compassion, your love, your mercy, and your grace. And so teach us the importance of receiving godly counsel. I know the steps of a righteous man. They are ordered by the Lord. But God, not only do you order my steps, I thank you because you also order my stops. And so help us to understand the steps and the stops of life and the power of godly counsel. In Jesus' name we pray. Heads are bound, eyes are closed, saints of God are praying. Father, we thank you for what we've just heard.